So tonight we are talking about data storage or files. And the reason I say data storage is because I think the word file makes people think of a single entity, whereas what we're really talking about is data storage. How do I store my data in a persistent fashion so I can get to it again after my program stops running? Everything we've done up till now has been about um, what's happening in the running memory. You type in something to an input, you process it, it's done, and the program ends. And that input just goes away. It goes, it goes into the ether. We don't want to do that anymore, and that's not how the real computer world works. Everything is stored in files, and we'll go over that in just a second. I think I'm a little ahead of myself. So we have some new things that we're dealing with for files. A couple of new functions, actually a lot of new functions. These are just the beginning. And one new keyword. Um, open gets a file descriptor, and I will um, explain more about that in a bit. Close returns that file descriptor. Read gets everything from a file, and we're going to learn a couple different ways to read. And with is a new keyword, and it negates the need for close. And I know this is all kinds of esoteric, but I'm going to go into detail in all these things in just a few minutes. But these are things you're going to need for your labs. So what's a file? It's not an existential question. Everything is a file. What you're looking for right now, what you're looking at right now on my screen is a file. The, you know, can I have everybody mute, please? Okay. The um, pie charm is a file. Your .py files are files. Databases are files. They are all stored on the disk. And when we start getting into files, what we're really doing is we're getting closer to the operating system. Everything we've done so far, we haven't cared much about the operating system because Python takes care of all that for us. And it still takes care of things for us with files, but we have to be more cognizant of some things. Um, because every time you access a file, you interact with the operating system. That's the important point here. Okay, so what can I do to file? Do it to a file? Well, you guessed it. We're back to CRUD. I can create one, I can read it, I can update it, and I can delete it. So, before we talk about that, we're going to go back to operating systems for a second. So, we have some major operating systems. We have Windows, we have Linux, we have Mac. And they all handle files differently. And I'm not just talking about the slash. I'm talking about what they do with the file descriptor, how many open files you can have at one point in time. They're all limited resources. And each operating system manages these limited resources differently. Um, but you want to write a code that's going to manage, that, that's going to reuse as many of these resources efficiently as possible. And potentially, you want to write your Python script so it runs on Windows or Mac or Linux. Now, for this week, you don't have to worry about that because we're not dealing with like directory structures. But we want to understand some of what's going on. Now, Python um, provides the ability to use some OS-dependent um, functionality from within Python in a way that we don't have to worry about the operating system. The principle I'm talking about right now is called write once, run many. And that means I can write my code, and I'm writing it on a Windows system, and I can put it on a Mac, it's going to run on a Mac. Or I can put it on a Linux system, and it's going to run on a Linux system. That makes your programming more versatile. Way back in the old days of programming, and in some cases it still happens, when you're dealing with a language that's closer to the operating system, like C and C++, you really have to understand how to manage your resources at a very low level. 
Python doesn't require you to do that at such a low level, and it really is handy. Also, with languages like C and C++, you can't write them and run them, and run them on a Linux system and then just take that executable and run it on a Mac or or especially on a Windows system, it won't work. It has to be recompiled. Other libraries may have to be brought in. It is a whole process. So it's important to, to understand where we are in our, in our layering system, because the oper hardware operating system, lower level languages, and higher level languages. So we're co closer to the higher level languages. So all files have properties. And you have the file data, which is great, but you have information about the file that is stored on hard disk along with the file. So you have things like the name of the file, the size of the file, where on disk it is. Um, this is all called metadata, and it's contained in a file descriptor object. So here is my properties and my content. So there's two different things here. There is the metadata, the name, the size, the direct, you know, the directory that it's stored in. And what's what's inside the file, what we care about, what we want to get to. But you have to understand that you have both of these. And also when you try and open a file, it's going to open a file descriptor which is going to be a temporary property of the file. So you have more permanent properties like the name and more temporary properties like the file descriptor. And even the size can be a temporary property because you may change the size of your file when you write to it. Okay, so now we go back to CRUD. How do I open a file and what can I do with a file? Well, first of all, you have to use the open function. And the open function is very simple. It's open and you give it a file name and then you give it a mode. The file name is the fully qualified name of the file, which also which can include its space on disk, where where it is, where its address is. And the mode is what am I going to do to the file? So I have a variable called my file. I know it's a variable. It's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. This will become my file descriptor. Now the file descriptor is not the contents of the file. It is the ability to get to the contents of the file. It's kind of like I'm handing you a bucket, but you have to open the top of the bucket and reach in to get the tennis balls. Um, I have the function itself, which is the ability to open a file. I have the name of the file, which could be qual fully qualified, and I have the mode. Now the mode is the, the basic modes are read, write, append, and binary. We're only talk about a little teeny bit about binary because we don't really use binary in this class. Um, I, you can combine these. So you can combine R and W and you could open a file for reading and writing. You could open it for appending, which means you can't read from it, but if you write to it, it's only going to add to the bottom. And you can open it for writing, which will remove the contents. So if you do, just do a W, you're going to remove all the contents of the file. It's like starting with a new one. So that's the basic structure of how you open a file. Now remember, open doesn't give you the data. Open gives you a way to get to the data. And then you have to close. Now I'm going to sound like a broken record tonight. You always have to remember to close. If you don't close, you do not return the system resource, which is the file descriptor, and you may not also actually write any data that you expected to. And I'll tell you why that's going to why why that is in a bit. But if you open it, you got to close it. Okay, if it already exists in the location specified, Python will open it. If the file does not exist, at the location, then Python will create it when using W or R. Um, and you're going to see this a lot tonight. Remember to close your files. Um, so I just opened a file. Well, well, how can I get to the data? Well, the way you can get to the data is by reading the data. 
So here I've got my file again. I'm opening my file. I'm going to use the read function that is a property of the file descriptor. So I would have my file dot read open and close, which says read everything from my file and assign that to Meister, the variable Meister. It's that simple. Now, read seems like a very easy thing to do, and it is. And for what you guys are doing, it's probably fine. If you're out in the real world, read doesn't always work well because there might be massive amounts of data that you're trying to read. So you can't actually read everything in at once. So you ne again, we're managing resources. So every byte that I read in from a file increases the size of my Python script as it's running. It doesn't inc increase the size of the .py file, but it increases the memory footprint. So that is something to be cognizant of. Um, the function is provided by Python and it works with the file descriptor, whatever the file descriptor is. So what happens when I read it? What happens is my stir gets a string and it is, this is a text slash new line slash n, which is the new line with two lines. So that's what my stir is. It's at the point at which it settles on Meister, it is simply a string in a variable. I now have access to it and I can do whatever I want with it, just like any other string in Python. And of course, you have to learn to close the file. Now, if I close the file, I don't lose the value in Meister. Closing the file simply returns the file descriptor back to the operating system, but you can go along and do whatever you want with Meister. It is now a string that resides in your program. Okay, so read data from a file as a list. So maybe I want things that are structured and I don't want just one big long string. Well, how do I do that? Well, I can do something called read lines. So I still have my file, I've opened my file. That hasn't changed. I now have a function called read lines. What read lines does for me is it says, okay, read each individual line. And what is a line? A line ends with backslash n or slash n. I'm sorry, I never get my slashes right. Um, so, so it will basically take every line and create this long list for you or short list, whatever it is. So what I get with read lines is different than I got with read. I get a list with two different lines in it. So that's one way to read it is everything. And another way to read it is read lines. And you might need to use one of those two when you're doing your labs this week. And of course, I close my file. So, you can also read data line by line. Again, Python detects the new line character, the escape sequence for a new line, and then it will simply allow you in a loop to read the lines of your file. So, I have my file again. I'm going to open my file, and in this case, I'm going to use a for loop with the, with the in operator. So, and this is very handy. I'm going to have a variable called line that is available, it's a local scope variable to the for loop. And what line is gonna do, I'm just gonna read each line individually and print it. So first line is gonna be printed, this is a file, then it's gonna go back up to the top of the loop. It's no different than any other loop. And then I'm gonna read it, and I'm gonna get the second line, and when I'm done with the loop, I still have to close. So it's just another way to read the data from a file depending on how you want to process it. Maybe you want it as a list so that you can pass it around as a list and do different things to it. Maybe you just want to handle each individual line, do something with it, 
and then be done with it. That it all depends on how you want to process the data in that file. Um, closing a file. I know I've said it multiple times, we're going to do a whole slide on it right now. A file descriptor is a system resource. There are only so many file descriptors on a system. Now, in our big multi-processor you know, world, you would think that you can't run out of file descriptors. A few years ago, in the application that I helped write, we ran out of file descriptors. We, didn't, we, we missed something. Um, so it tells you the volume of data that we process sometimes, but you have to be careful not to run out of file descriptors. Um, just like with any, it's, it's just another system resource. It's just something you have to manage. Opening gets it, closing returns it to the file system. And when you close, you, can, you will write any changes made to the file. Modifying data and writing it into the file doesn't necessarily, it doesn't make it all the way to the file sometimes because there's this thing called the buffer, which we're going to talk about. So closing will make sure that if you've put anything into the file, it actually physically gets written to disk. Um, and then when you return the file descriptor, it no longer, uh, it no, you no longer have access to that file. So you must always close the file. Writing to a file. Why was I just talking about this buffer thing? Because this is what really happens. Okay, on every, every modern operating system, you never write directly to the file. What you do is you write to a buffer. Now, first of all, sorry, how do I write to a file? My apologies. I'm opening a file called myemptyfile.txt, and I've got a W there because it's open for writing. So then I can use the write function on my file descriptor and add data to my file. But I don't ever really add data to my file until I, it's flushed or closed. Now if you're using large amounts of data, the buffer will flush, flush automatically when it gets filled up. So let's say your buffer is 100,000 lines, whatever that means, or 100,000 bytes. When it gets to that limit, it's going to flush it out and write it actually to disk. Now why do we have this buffer. Writing to disk is the most expensive operation you can do on a computer, period, uh, except maybe one of the big supercomputers. Then I'm not sure. But for most modern computers that we're going to use, it's expensive. It's expensive to get to, to actually physically write something to disk. So we buffer it to make it less of an expensive operation and allow our computers to run faster. So that's why we have a buffer. And I can write as many lines to the buffer as I want. I never actually know about the buffer. I'm not, I'm not readily managing the buffer. Python is managing this buffer for me. And when I close, what happens is the buffer is flushed and, the, and you're actually writing the contents to the disk. And I know I'm talking a lot and we'll get to in just a couple minutes, we'll get to some Python scripts. So um, if you want to open a file for reading and writing, you use RW and this will allow you to read in the data, modify it, and write it out. Uh, writing to a file before you close. So maybe I've got a lot of stuff going on. And, and there are times when I'm, I don't want to leave the management of the buffer to Python. Well, I want to manage the buffer myself. Well, how do I do that? The way I do that is when I write, I write to the buffer, and then after so many times when I write, what I do is I flush the buffer. Tuh flush the buffer. It's a function called flush. You use it on the file descriptor 
and it simply forces the file descriptor to write whatever contents are in the buffer to the disk. That's all it does. And always remember to close the file after the loop exits, not in the loop. The close is outside the loop. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to do the with command, and then I'm going to go through and I'm going to do some Python scripts. And by the way, at the end of the class, if you have questions, including on your project, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, so I have a file, my text file. I want to open that text file. I want to process it line by line, and I want to be done with it. I have this beautiful keyword called with. With is used for files, not really anything else. And basically, what it does is it allows you in a closed loop to process the file, and when it is done with that file, it closes it and does all of the management for you. You don't have to worry about anything. My suggestion in Python is if you're dealing with files, use with. So we have, it, this, it's a little different than what we saw before. What we saw before is we had my file equal open. Well, in this case, it's a little backwards from that. I have the with keyword. I have my open function to tell me what I want, that I want to open my file. And now I have as. As is another keyword. It's used with, with. And it's just giving me a local variable. As is almost like saying my file equal whatever's coming in from open text at the moment. So I have line equal my file dot read line. So I'm just going to read it however I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to print it out. And then I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to print it out. And when I'm done, the file is closed automatically. You are going to be using with in your function, in your labs this week. And I know the labs are daunting. They're, they're good sized labs this week. Um, with tells Python that it's going to have a loop and it's going to specifically loop over um, the contents of a file. Okay, so let's go back and do a little programming now. Uh, what is this? Okay, so since we're probably going to be using with a lot this week, this is just a quick with. So where's my many lines.txt? Here's my many lines.txt. One, two, three, four. Um, and for right now, for this class, you don't have to worry about, well, with Zybooks, you don't have to worry about where it is. But if you're doing this, if you're if you're doing any of your labs in PyCharm, it's okay to not worry about putting a directory structure because it will always go in the same place as your .py file. So this is just, uh, I'm just going to open a file, I'm going to read in the lines, I'm going to do some stuff to it, and then I'm going to be done. So let's just debug this real quick. Uh, where am I? Here we go. Okay, so I'm just going to run through this, or debug this, and let's see what happens. First of all, I have no variables. When I step over my width, you will see that I have this thing right here called an I.O. text I.O. wrapper for many lines, many underscore lines dot txt with a mode of reading. So what, what this is, is this is basically the address of the file descriptor. That's what F is. 
and it's got an I/O buffer. So when we're talking here, we have we're using something called a buffered reader. So on the way in, Python's actually going to buffer it. We don't really care as much about the buffering on the way in as the way out, but it is going to buffer it. And here's some metadata about the file. Okay, is it closed? What's its encoding? Um, line buffering is false. It's not really line buffering. What's my mode? What's the name? All of that, this is all metadata. This is all that data about the data that the file descriptor is maintaining. So if I step over and I say read lines, I now have a variable called fl, and read lines just read everything in to a list. So now I have a list of all this stuff, and I'm going to go do something with it. Well, right now I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to print it. That's all I'm going to do. And when I'm done, this is what I have. So that is what with does. And I recommend that you use it whenever you possibly can. Now we're going to be doing a CSV file, and you will want to use with. And we'll do a little bit of a comma separated dot py in a bit to talk about how to use it. This will be very similar to one of the labs that you have to do this week. Do I have words.csv there? Yeah, I do. Okay, just checking. So this is just a little bit, you don't really have to worry about this, but when you have cer certain things in operating systems are different, like slashes and backslashes for directory structures. Python allows you to neutralize this. And it does this by giving you some modules. We're going to be working with a module called OS for operating systems. By the way, there, there, are, there are just thousands and thousands of Python modules out there. If you're thinking you have to write something from scratch, go look at Python first because Python may have already done it for you. And in this case, it has. Where are you going to use something called the OS module? And how I use that is I import it. Now, what import does is it basically takes anything on that import statement and in the memory of your running Python script, it copies it in. So it can make the memory big. But for right now, we're just going to import. Sometimes you can just import individual functions if you only want those. Right now, we're just going to import all of the OS module. And when you're dealing with fully qualified, not fully qualified file names, which basically are you're telling Python where the file is you want on your system, you're going to want to use the OS. And it also has got, it's not just about directory structures, there's a whole lot of stuff. You can actually go out and traverse directory structures. You can change directory structures. You can do all kinds of things with the OS module. So I'm going to import OS. And basically, it's going to go out and get an external script. OS is the name of the module. That's all it is. And what, you, what, it, what you'll find is somewhere out there in the in Python's standard libraries is something called os.py. And so it's going to read in the os.py file. And here I want to create a file path. And I don't want to, I want it to run on both Linux and Windows. So I'm going to say os.join and it's going to create this as a directory structure in Linux or Windows depending on where I'm running my Python script at the time. If I'm running my Python script on Linux, it's going to give me my backslashes or slashes. I never get it right. And if it's running it on Windows, it's going to do the slashes the other way. So this is just very handy. You're not going to really have to use that this week, but I just wanted to mention it to you as part of Python and what it does to remove you from the operating system and also to talk about importing modules because you're going to have to import a module called CSV this week or CSV Reader. Real quick on binary data. Okay. 
Not all data is human readable. In fact, most data isn't human readable. You talk about imagery, GIF, JPEG, GIF, PNG, etc. Movies, audio, Microsoft Office. Have you ever just tried to open a Microsoft Office document in a text editor? You will find that it is not human readable. That's because it's all encoded and it's binary. And um, there are ways of dealing with binary data. We don't need to deal with binary data. But since Zybooks mentions it, I thought I would mention it. And it's basically using the B in front of whatever your value is. So in this case, it turns it into bytes. So it tells Python to treat the string as binary, and it will print it out with a B, and it will type it as a B. Now, that was just really quick. Comma-separated value files. We're going to spend a little bit of time going through this because the two labs this week are large, okay? Two, especially one of them is very large. So I want to make sure that you guys are prepared to do it. The first one talks about um, using something called the CSV module and to deal with things in a comma-separated value format. All comma-separated value format is, is it, Strings with commas, because everything coming in from Python, to Python is a string, in rows. So if you've ever saved a spreadsheet out and as a CSV, that's what it is. It's just values that are comma separated. So what does a comma separated value file look like? Well, it looks like this. I have this thing called words.csv, and it's just words separated by commas. And I want to create a list from the contents of words.csv, um, removing duplicate words. So I need to have the contents of the list that ends up that I end up with being unique. So I'm going to input import something called CSV. CSV already does everything I need to deal with when it comes to comma-separated value files. I'm going to create an empty list because I need some place to put the stuff. Now I'm going to open words.csv and I'm going to give it the variable words. Okay, so I'm going to use with open words.csv as words. And then what do I want to do? Well, I want to read all of the content in from words.csv. And I'm going to do that by using the csv.reader function. I'm going to give it the variable I want to use. And I'm going to give it the delimiter of a comma, because it doesn't actually have to be a comma-separated value file. And then I'm going to go through each row in the content and I am going to basically do a counter over the rows and I'm going to say if row counter not in word list, make sure the word is not already in the list. Then I'm going to append it to my word list and when I'm done I'm going to print my word list. So. What I've done is read something in, in a specific format, csv.reader basically gives me a, um, a multidimensional list. And then for each individual row in that multidimensional list, and it's okay if there's only one, I'm going to do a normal for loop and say, is there, are these things duplicate? If it's already there, don't put it there. So let's go and take a look really quick at comma separated dot py. Because this is, this is very similar to one of the labs you're going to have to do this week. So first I just have words.csv, cat in the hat, hat in the hand. 
That's all it is, just some words. And I'm going to run through this. So let's see what happens. Actually, I'm going to put my breakpoint there. Uh, comma separated. And I'm going to debug this because we all know how much I like the debugger. So what do I have from frames and variables? Right now I have my word list, which I've already created, which is empty. And again, I have to do this in the global scope. So we've been talking a lot about files, but there is still a global and a local scope to deal with. I created word underscore list as an empty list in the global scope so I can use the contents of it, which are going to be populated from the file, later on in the global scope. So I'm going to open words.csv as words. So I do that, and I now have, we see this again, text.io wrapper. I have a file name. I have a mode. I've only opened it for reading. Oh, by the way, if you open without a mode, it's always read only. And here's all my, here's all the file descriptor, the, the metadata stuff for my file. And now I'm going to use the CSV reader. I'm going to have csv.reader, and what is that going to return to me? Well, oops. it's going to return contents. Contents is a CSV reader object. Okay? So it's telling me what the delimiter is, but this is not like a normal list of lists. It's a CSV reader. But I can do, I can treat it as if it were a multidimensional list, and I can ask it for a row. So I can then step over this and just treat it like any other list at this point. The time I get here on line 8, I just treat it like a list. And so you'll see that word list is getting populated. And I'm going to print it out. And I can even change this file and say, um, uh, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. How's that? So I just can add another line, and we will see that when I do comma separated dot py, it's just going to behave the same, except I'm going to have more words in it. So I'm going to open words.csv, same file, nothing different. I'm going to get this, the content from the CSV reader. Content is still a CSV reader object, okay, with a delimiter of a comma. And, and so we can go in and see, and the line number. So I'm going to step over, and row is now, I still have the same row I had before. I'm going to run through that row, just like I would with any other for loop. So as soon as that's done, I go up to content again. So now I'm going to step over this, but this time it doesn't stop. This time it keeps on going because I have more words. So the interesting thing is here, I've changed that file, so there's more data coming in. I haven't changed my program in the least, but my program is written in such a way is where it's going to happily go through and check everything and add it into the word list and be done when it's, at, when it's output. So now it outputs the longer one. So this demonstrates that you can change the file, how the CSV reader works. Now, I want to do a few things. Um, I want to mention a few things. I haven't talked a lot about colons tonight, but I'm about to. Got to remember colons. 
with is just like any other loop. And if you forget that colon, you're going to get an error. If I try and run this, I'm going to get my lovely little syntax error, invalid syntax. Um, word list has to be defined in the global scope. And reader has to be from CSV. So I can either do csv.reader or I can say uh, from CSV import reader. And then I can just go reader. That's just another syntax. Maybe I don't want to import everything from CSV. Maybe I just want to import the reader. And when I run this, it will run exactly the same. So this just pinpoints what it is you want to happen. Um, I'm trying to think about um, errors I can show you. Well, let's keep going, and then we will talk about errors if we have time, because I want to leave time to talk about other stuff. So actually, let me go to the next slide. Okay. So... List to a dictionary. You're going to also need this for your lab. So the content, this is the contents of a dictionary contains key value pairs. Unfortunately, the key is stored on a different line as the value. This is going to sound very much like a lab you have. Um, for example, the key is the first line in the file and the value is the second. Create a dictionary from the file and print it out in the format of key colon value. So here is my contents. I have a list. This list could also be from a file. I just didn't want, I didn't have the space on this slide to open the file. So assuming you're opening the file and you're reading it in as a list, which might be read lines or um, could be CSV reader if it's comma separated. But anyway, this is the contents. Or I think in the lab, actually, Zybooks is giving you the list. Um, so what I want to do, what I want to have in the end, is I want to have what's down here in the lower right-hand corner. I want to have name colon Lisa, answer colon 42, amount colon 3.14. So I'm going to create, in the global scope, a variable called my dict to hold my empty dictionary. So now I want to do for counter in range len contents. And this is not file based because this is just talking about what you have to do to create that part of the lab. All right, so I'm basically just going to counter, I'm going to um, for range in len contents, so however many contents there are, I'm going to say if counter plus one is less than the length of the contents, because remember I'm going over two, and counter modulo 2 is 0, contents of counter not in my dict. So I want to make sure the contents are not already in the dictionary. The key is not. And then I'm going to basically populate my dictionary with the contents at counter and setting the value to contents of counter plus 1. And then I'm going to print it. For this example, we're using a list. So 7.8, word frequencies. This may be a little bit like a cat in the hat. I'm going to import CSV. I'm going to have a file name but that's going to be input. Zybooks is going to give you the file name. I'm going to create an empty word list in the global scope. I am going to, now here, here I have a hint, the with statement. Pseudocode, I really can't use the word with because it's language specific. So I'm saying CSV files open a file for reading and then while there are more lines in to be read in the CSV file. But here's where you want to look at the with statement. And then I'm going to set the user file equal to the result of the CSV reader and then for each row in the file, because I don't know how many rows it's going to be in that file from, um, from Zybooks, 
And then for index and length of row, whatever index is just a variable, row is just, we're just doing a for loop over a list at this point, just like we did in the other CSV reader. If the value of row at index is not in the word list, I'm going to output the value of row at index. And so I'm going to basically append, I'm going to output it, and I'm going to append it to the word list. So that's, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that's 7.8. 7 7.9 is the big one. So 7.9, what you have to do is um, you're going to have to basically create, you're going to have to create a list of TV shows, sort them, and, and the, you get the list of TV shows from a file, you're going to have to sort them and write it to a file and then reverse sort them, I think, and write it to another file. It's a lot. This is a, this is a big one. So my suggestion is if you are having trouble, get the other stuff done around it because you don't get any more points for doing this big one than you do for the little ones. And this is crunch time. A lot of people may not have gotten as far as they wanted to on their project. Your project is worth a lot of points. Um, so if you're time boxing to try and get things done, this needs to be lower on your list because it's the exact same number of points as any of the other labs in 7.9. You didn't hear that from me, but time boxing can be important when you are working on projects. I'm working on a project right now, and I'm time boxing it so that I know exactly what I can get done, and there may be some features that don't get in, but I've got a deadline. So similar here. So um, I've added a couple comments to make this easier. Starting from the first item in a list and every other item is key. So we have a key value pair. So we have to create a dictionary just like that other program. And every value in between is a value. So you're creating a key value pair. You're creating a dictionary based on a list. So Index at 0 is a key, index at 1 is a value, index at 2 is a key, index at 3 is a value, index at 4, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, index at 4 is a key, uh, index at 5 is a value, and I'll stop because I can't apparently count tonight. So, this is me creating that list, all right? I'm just going to say for index and length of output list, I've got a temporary list. I've got my list object. Um, and then if index put one is less than length of the output and index modulo two is equivalent to zero, convert the list object to an integer because we're dealing with ints. Um, first object, in my dict, remove new line. Make sure you strip the new lines here. Append output list at index plus one to my dict as the object. And that's just what we did. This stuff is just what we did in like three slides ago. Otherwise, remove the new line, append it, and set it um, my dict at list object to temp list. So if it is there, you've got some stuff to do if it's not there. So this is if if the item, or if the key already exists in the dictionary, this is what you have to do. If it doesn't, then this is what you have to do. So this is part two. This is where the files come in. Um, so you're going to sort your keys from the least amount of years to the greatest amount of years. Um, so you're going to set sorted my dick to sorted to sorted. So there's probably a function in here somewhere that Python already gives you for sorting. 
And so then you're going to set my dict of sorted my keys to a new dictionary. Now we have to change the dictionary to a list. So we're going to go through and create a list from the dictionary. Sorry, we're going to create a dictionary. Yeah, a list from the dictionary. And then we're going to show it. So now we're going to put everything into a single list. This thing is really complex. Um, and then we're going to sort it. Now part three is, and I'm sorry, here's the part where you finally get to doing something with files. You're going to open a file called openkeys.txt for writing. You're going to basically, for the key value pair, convert the key to a string, write key plus colon to the file for item i in value, basically for, um, yeah, write the item plus a semicolon to the file, write the value to the file, write a new line, and then close the file. Then we're going to open another file for writing, and then we're going to write the item from show list split to a different file. Now, you're not going to see any output, and this is where these get really, really tricky. Because Python's going to write that file for you and it's going to go into that file and it's going to see whether or not you have things in the right format. This can get very frustrating. Time box it. Seriously. Okay. So that was the lecture. We still have 10 minutes. I didn't go massively over. I know I did go through some things fast. What questions do people have? Going once, going twice. Does anybody have any questions? You can take it off mute if you want. Okay, then. I guess we're done earlier than I thought. Uh, if you're in my class, as always, email me if you have questions. Um, and good luck on the project and good luck with this module and I will see you next week. And by the way, um, it, you, do, you guys are doing great, okay? You're doing absolutely spectacular. You've made it this far. There's just a couple more weeks to go and I think you're doing wonderful. So everybody have a really good evening and I will talk to you next week.